come from a storytelling tradition where we do call and response. Good afternoon. We are doing well. Because in my storytelling tradition, if people don't respond, it means you're doing a really bad job. And that the people who are looking at you like you're doing a bad job want to sit there instead. So at any time, if I look up and um, you look like you think these guys are doing a really bad job, I'll just tell them, sit down, and I'll pick my panel from the floor. <laughs> but what good, I want to say good afternoon. I want to say welcome to all of you. It's really, really a thrill. This festival is a dream come true because we're not only talking books, but we're looking at books at the very many levels. They entertain us, they lift us up, they reflect our lives, they pick us up when we are down, and they also make us think. And I think one of the things, I, I, I work sometimes with activists, and one of the things, because there is so much to do in our world, we always want to act, act, act. And I've always said, but you know, when you, you can only act if you've taken time to think. And so one of the things, and I want to just acknowledge that Yvonne, who is one of the co-founders, is here. One of the things I really love about this festival is it gives us the permission to think. I love the fact that this particular panel, I love your work, and we are going to talk about it. But I love the fact that apart from us talking about the work that they have produced, um, we are also going to be entering their worlds as intellectuals. And intellectuals doesn't mean that they work in academia, although they do, some of them, sometimes. But that these are people who do the work of thinking. So today we are here to think about history. And one of the things I have learned is that there is the small H and the big H, and there's a whole world, even in that world, word histories. And how the histories that we find, the histories that we make, the histories that we encounter, the ones we embrace, the ones we reject, relate to our own understanding of what home is, our understanding of who we are, and our understanding of community. And I'm going to be inviting you, it's um, 12.30, I'm going to be inviting you and I'm going, to have, we've, we've, I'm going to make time for you also to join us in that thinking. So I want to prep you earlier on that when we come to the thinking part, this is a conversation. I, I have huge respect for the three people who are here with me, but I don't expect them to have all answers. I am hoping they disagree with each other and we are allowed to disagree with them even when they agree with them. So, karibuni sana. I am not going to translate that into Portuguese or English because I am sure after three days they know what that means. Usually, my name is Mishai Mwangola and I love books. I read books. I perform books. I am a book person. When I was small, my dad warned I would be wearing glasses before I hit 10, and he was right, because I have those kids who, after lights out, you pull that, you know, over, and then you're still trying to read by a little light, not even a torch. Um, I'm going to ask each of my three collaborators on stage to introduce themselves. I will say a little bit more about them later. But my first question to all of you as a way of starting is, who are you? Who are you in relation to where you call home? Who are you in relation to the communities that you say you belong to? And who are you in relation to your identity? We'll come back and look at those three words, home, belonging, and identity. But I'm just inviting you to tell me, who are you? Does anybody want to go first? No, you please, no, 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 you first. Teams have been bullied into going first. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I mean, naturally, that's not an easy question to answer. But I promise not to be long. But so, I was born and bred in South Africa. I have a home. I don't have a home in South Africa. I have a home in the UK. I spend maybe three months of the year in South Africa. In addition to working in the UK, I work in the US. So, where is home? And I, I want to tell a brief story about that. Um, 
a couple of years ago, I was on a, a flight from Copenhagen to London, and the flight was cancelled because of an airline strike. And I was standing in a long queue to get onto another flight, and these two men in front of me started arguing about the strike. They were speaking English. And the one said, this is terrible, I'm never flying with this airline ever again, this is outrageous. And the other one said, no, these are workers and they're going on strike and that's their right. And we must just be patient. And they were arguing and arguing and then eventually one of them said, well, I'm from Finland. And it's, the one said, what? I'm also from Finland. And <laughs> they'd had a whole argument, a whole discussion without knowing that they were both from the same place. And, and the reason they didn't know they were from the same place is because they're like me. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I'm part of a privileged elite for whom um, international relations allow very easy travel, uh, where you can live in any number of maybe 14, 20 cities around the world and easily call home, easily get into a network of people who are similar to you or maybe from different backgrounds. It's a global clerical class, a global class of people who are highly educated and for whom there's an infrastructure um, now in most parts of the world. Um, and we have a background, we have a place that's called home and it's very rich in memory, but the whole political economic structure of the world makes it very easy for us to be fluid, any, easy for us to be traveled, to get work in all sorts of places. And that is so very different from the way the rest of humanity moves or does not move. Most of my fellow South Africans are stuck, not just in South Africa, but in a particular region inside it and have no alternative. Most of the human beings who move do so either illegally or into places where they're not welcome. Um, and so home is just a dramatically different place depending on who you are, where you fit into this world system. Um, and I like to hope that I recognize that my particular relation to home is a is a very specific one and, and a very privileged one. Um, and one of the things I write about is what home means for others who are quite unlike me. Um, good afternoon. Home, well, it reminds me of, um, it's not a story, actually, I don't know the word in English. You know this um, tiny black thing that rides very slowly in the garden, very wettish, a lejma. What's that in? It's, it's, yeah, it's a cousin of a snail. Slug, yeah, I think it's the slug. So there were slugs in our garden, and we, I was talking once to my grandmother, because I, I like to, 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 you know, to follow them, and it's very easy to follow a slug. I mean, you have to be patient, but it's easy. It's not complicated. <laughs> It's complicated to follow um, Gazella. Gazella, it's that one that jumps. So I used to stay looking, you know, and we were, you know, in those quiet moments, and we were okay with silence, myself and my grandmother. And I was, you know, trying to make um, a hard question to my grandmother. So there were several slugs in there. I said, "Where are they going?" <laughs> and my grandmother smiled and said, "They are going home." But I saw one was going left, the other one was going up the wall, and the other one was going back. And I said, home. Like, we, we used to sit there several times. But um, every day they're going home, like in a different direction and all. And she said, home is a place that you, you, them, find. Home is a place that you find. Like, if you wish, no? And I was like, damn, I thought the question was hard. And she was like, ding, 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 solved. So in fact, I think that was a seed, you know? I'm, I'm not sure if she knew what she was doing. Maybe she was, maybe she was not. But the universe knew. And they were uh, giving me this seed where, as you, uh, I used to travel a lot. Um, now I try to travel less. It's not possible yet. Uh, but now I went home again, so I learned that what I felt like being home is my hometown, Luanda. And it has nothing to do, I think, not nothing, it, it's not only about love, you know, I, I don't particularly love Luanda, I love another place, I love, I love Lubango, which is further south, but I do love the, the rhythm and the people and an idea of Luanda that it's not there anymore. I, I, I have now 
I'm, I think I'm old enough to recognize that I miss a place that will simply not exist anymore because it's part of the past, you know. It's the same buildings, the same city, but you are not in the same place. Um, and that I'm beginning to accept that idea. It's very unrestful. And I used to study in Lisbon, then I went back to Angola, then I went to another place, then I went back to Angola, then I lived for several years in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. And, you know, I could never make, create, reinvent home in another place, which is okay. I mean, some people can. They just move, and after two months or two years, they say, no, home is here. And people think it's because you want to say you are from that place. No, I just didn't feel at home. In Portugal, I didn't feel at home in Brazil. They were all very nice people. But home is home somewhere and is not. So I am a non-homer. I'm a non-belonging. I am a... I'm wondering, there is this word in Portuguese, saudade, you know? Saudade is like when you feel saudade for, like, I have chronical, I have this disease, saudades crónicas, chronical, uh, what is it, longing or what is it, no? Yeah, nostalgia, so I'm, yeah, identity and the other word was home, identity and belonging. Well, belonging, it's me and my grandmother, we are, we are still discussing belonging. <laughs> and I, identity... <laughs> I'll talk about that later. Is this the same grandmother who once gave you something to play with and everybody else didn't see her except you? This one, it's the one you are talking about, uh -huh. it's her sister, which I also call grandmother. The one you okay. are talking about, it's grandmother Katarina, and this one is grandmother Agnet. But I have 17, so it's... <laughs> So let me encourage you guys, after this, please go and Google each of these guys. I've been spending time with them before I met them, and they are amazing, wonderful people. I really, really encourage you to listen to their podcasts. Yvonne. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you guys. Uh, that question, home, um, it, I think it's for me, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's both a wound and uh, a, a treasure. Um, home is the place I always try to leave, and I've been trying to leave uh, both the country and the city for over 30 years. Um, but like a kind of a homesick bird, I come back. Um, home is the moment I land in Nairobi, uh, especially in the morning. And you know that smell, that smell of the Nairobi morning, uh, and the cliché sunrise. Um, that Binyavanga decried, and, 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 and as sure to God, there will always be an, an acacia tree in the distance. And there's a feeling, a, feeling that, uh, a feeling in the heart, in the soul. And you're thinking, I hate this country, I hate this country, but there are tears rolling down your eyes. What am I doing coming back? But when the plane lands, you want to kiss the ground? Home is a moment when that sulky bureaucrat at Kenjoma Kenyatta International Airport takes your passport and just kind of looks at you up and down and say, Umerudi. <laughs> I say, and you kind of, there's the, the reluctance, uh, acceptance of saying, um, this place um, that, I'm, that keeps me uneasy, for some reason has a purpose uh, for wanting me uh, to still be here. Home is the place of mom's laughter, and uh, yet it is also in a very strange play, in a, in a very strange way. Um, I was away in uh, in Germany for the last kind of um, well, I was away for nine months, and to my embarrassment, and it's and yeah, this embarrass embarrassment is sustained. Um, I happened to fall in love with that ugly city, Berlin. Um, and uh, I'm still struggling, and I'm trying to understand why. Because um, as much as I say I hate Nairobi, I also say I love Nairobi. And I thought that I was um, a, a monogamous person regarding the city to which one belongs. Um, I felt like I'm committing adultery with a, a very ugly creature that everybody disapproves of, yet somehow I just say I love it. So uh, that, that I've got to figure out. Um, home is also the airport lounge, the transition zone where one feels most comfortable, really, um, and you're about to take off to somewhere unknown. And um, uh, so sometimes I describe myself as an in-betweener. Um, 
But when, I, when I'm pushed to the corner and told uh, to what you belong, it's easier for me to say I belong to the sea. Yeah. So we'll come to all of that. What I'm going to ask, because I'm listening to all of you, one of the things that's in common is all of you are people who go away and come back, who travel, what you said, the privilege of being able, you know, there are people who, this is my home because I was born, I live all my life, I never have a choice to go anywhere else, and I know when I die, I'll be buried here. And then there's people who move, who travel, who go places, and then, as you said, I mean, um, you can have a home in other places, you can find some places you go and you're like, ah, I belong here. I really like that sense of the past and nostalgia, because we'll come back to that. And I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about your books. Now, um, if I start with Transparent City, each of these books really starts with a sense of place. We enter in and we're in this building. And suddenly, as you read the book, you realize this building is a character in itself. It's a very strange place. But the people who are there, this is home for them. And then there is this whole question. At the very beginning, you're asking yourself, why is this place so important? Um, this one, Johnny, I find really interesting because it is a man who is born in a place, as a, as a child, that's a very safe space, and then is forced out of it and spends the rest of his life in many different spaces. But one of the things I really love about this book is right at the beginning, he picks up a stick and breaks it and smells it and immediately he's transported across the continent from, you know, into a very different, his home in that sense. And then Yvonne, you start us with this island and this girl who's waiting for something. And in the course of her book, she's also going to go away and we're wondering if she will ever come back. So I'm going to ask each of you, this is, a, this is an essay, and you have a paragraph I should time you on this, because you're all good writers, you're all very good with language. Link that, those three books, I know you have other books, but those three books in particular. Link those three books to this sense of home and history. Should I start with Yvonne? Who do you guys want to start with? Johnny, Johnny, I'm sorry, I did. It's they who said. First, you bully me now, you bully me. <laughs> so, I mean, home in, in relation to a, a man of good hope. Well, it, I mean, it's so interesting that you talk about him, you know, at the age of 27, snapping open a, a twig, and he's transported back to, it was not just the smell of the ink that he used to write the Quran, but it was also the feeling of being high, uh, which, which the sap of the Greek tree gave him. So it was, it was a very, very deep memory of, of being in an altered state, which is so very powerful. Um, but the thing about nostalgia, you know, is that it's, it's nine-tenths fantasy. The, the very nature of nostalgia is that it's not real. And so you're remembering something as if it's your past, but it's actually you in the present fantasizing. And that makes home a very mercurial place. Um, it's something that you've invented in your head. Uh, it's, it's very hard to pin down. And Assad, the, the, you know, the, the central character in this book, gets to confront that in the way that most of us don't, because he feels deeply in his bones that he is Somali, and yet he has not been to Somalia since he was eight years old. He doesn't think he can ever go back there. And at one point says, what on earth is home? You know, what does it mean to be Somali if this is this place I can't even go to anymore? Um, and starts figuring out, just by the force of circumstances, that home is actually about something else. You know, home is about, again, a completely mythical history of his family. Um, and being able to recall who they were, even if it's empirically wrong, right through time. Um, and then imagining who they're going to be in the future, in five generations, in ten generations. And so home really becomes, you know, we talk about home as a place, but for him, home actually became, it was planted in another dimension, and that dimension was time. And the time was hundreds of years hundreds of years of an imagined past, hundreds of years of an imagined future, and all imagined, not real people in real time. So for me, that boggles the mind, that home is not necessarily about space, it can be about time, and it's not necessarily about real time, it's the time that you manufacture in your head. 
uh, and that's something with the circumstances of his life he was forced to confront and understand. Now I'm going to pick on Anja. And just a minute, one of the things that's also I find really interesting in that is, so he's, this is a, a, a young refugee from Somalia. And at one point, as he says, he's forced out of his country. He comes to Isili, not Eastly, and then goes back and finds a place that he never even knew. This is the mythical history that his people trace back hundreds, of, and they think that is home. He didn't know because he left very young, and yet he finds out that this is where my people call home. And I want to, I just want to link, because we'll come back to this, that throughout the book, what's very interesting is that they, everybody else who links back to this mythical history, wherever he lands, as long as he says, I am from this family and this clan, total strangers will open their doors and he belongs. He, they identify with him. I mean, that's true some of the time, and then other times this family lets him down. Yes, and then that's yes. not home either. And, and that's you know, traumatic in a way it's also. It's very traumatic. <laughs> but you know, I think another thing about home, another really difficult but interesting thing about home is that one of the things about being human, one of the unavoidable things about being human is to be disappointed. You know, all of us, no matter how successful we are, no matter how cushy life becomes, we're, we always imagine the way we're going to be in a year, in two years, in three years, and almost inevitably it doesn't turn out that way. Um, and so what home is, is constantly changing. And it's often changing in the face of disappointment. Um, and in Assad's case, he absolutely assumed that America was going to be home. He spent years dreaming of, you know, he's on the move, he's hustling, he's running, he's going to get to America and finally he'll be still, and that will be home. And he gets to America and finds it's a little bit more of the same. And then you have to adjust what home means. So, so home is, is, it sounds like somewhere which is still uh, and which is permanent, but it's actually being recalibrated, it's being adjusted all the time. Yes, I, I was just wondering, you know, in Angola, when we don't know the answer, we say, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> uh, I remember my father asking me, don't do that, don't, you know. So, can you repeat the question, please? It's relating, relating the book. Yes, just tell us a little bit uh, in terms of the book. Yeah. But I'm looking at this link between histories and home. Okay, yeah. Well, I think, really, to be honest, this was the first time I felt I was... Uh, writing about or with or something ugly or not so pretty about my city. Usually, this is a very, very different book from the others I've written about Luanda. You know, here in this one, Luanda is, as you said, the building, yes, but also Luanda is one of, of the characters. And um, it was very hard for me to see the things that were coming out of me, or my hand, my writing, about my own town. I was very worried and disappointed about the, the way things were going. And it's not the city, and it's not people, it's the way it was, you know, government. It was the post-war, this is post-war, like, the, it's set on, on um, everyone is, was coming there to, you know, finally, Angola uh, had um, a peace process, the, the war ended in 2002. We had been in, at war basically officially since 1961. 61, 75 against the, 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 the Portuguese colonialism presence. Then Cold War among ourselves and all. One year of peace, 91, 92, 1992. In 1992, from 1992 to 2002, extremely violent war among ourselves. Uh, basically between the government and UNITA. Uh, Savimbi, you know, decided to, to go on with this, even, you know, the Americans asked him to stop, and he said, I won't stop, I have money to go for 10 years more. Exactly what happened, 10 years more. So this is like the post-war, and it was ugly, you know, everyone kept using the war as an excuse not to do things. That's why, you know, there are so many transparent people in this book, which I don't think they should be transparent, but I think they are transparent. And by transparent, I mean the people who essentially the government does not see or does not want to see, but we also, as citizens, many times we choose who do we see and who do we help and who, and who works to turn on or off our guilty. We are all guilty in a way, 
me, everyone. The government is more because the go no, the government is more because the government has the power to do more. I, I do not take myself as a citizen, not as a writer, as a citizen out of the process, but I think the government, uh, uh, not uh, my government, many governments, they commit sometimes crimes by not doing things. Not only the crimes they commit by doing things, but also the crimes they commit. It's our part as citizens to tell them our opinion, at least our, our opinion. So yes, I'm not sure I'm answering, but it was very um, strong for me to write about Luanda like that. I had a terrible relationship with this book while I was writing, after I was writing, and it almost didn't come out. And then I, I stayed like three years, I couldn't look at this. I, I really didn't, I didn't even remember what, what it was in there. But then because it was there, and I know it, but my publisher thought, you know, I, I had no book because I kept telling about the book. And he said, come on, just tell me the truth. You never wrote the book, right? He said, no, actually I did. The book is written since, you know, I showed him the book in 2011 and the book was written since 2009. I mean, some people knew the book was real. I said, yeah, so, but in a way I feel like I did um, something honest. And for me, that's the most important. It's not, a, I mean, good in literary terms, but for me, my relationship with the country and with the city, it's always a thin line for us, especially, I don't know about the, here in Kenya, but in Angola, when you're outside of your country, I was studying or living in Brazil or whatever, or even in an interview, what do you say about your country? You don't want to, um, you know, be to lie. You don't want to offend, but you don't want to offend yourself by lying. So you have to tell things that for you are simple and true. But for the Angolans who are there, sometimes, oh, you said that in Portugal. You said you are talking, you know, about our, our city and our country like that. I said, but what's your opinion? No, I have the same opinion, but I won't say it outside. So it's, uh, it's I, mean, I understand that. And why I understand that? Not because of what you're saying, but the way it is used. As you know, usually in Europe and in the United States, they use what you say to make it worse. You know, we know it's not good. You know, it's some, you know, it's bad in a way, you know. But even he, he said so. And it's, it's, it's the worst place. No, I'm not saying it's the worst place of the world. We are not saying that, but they use it. And then, in your home country, they were, why did you say that? Didn't you know that it's going to be like, you know, so that, that was my only, you know, uh, break. I'm trying to break. How far can I go? And that sense, therefore, that when w the place you call home, yeah. or sometimes that calls you and says, yeah. you know, you belong to us, yeah. expects certain responsibilities, certain rights. And yet, I'm keeping in mind what you said, Johnny, that you are, there's going to be disappointment. You know this place. There is that ugliness that only someone who belongs can see. And, you know, I'm thinking about the, of, of the first day, the first the opening, where you started by saying, you know, I'm from South Africa, and here is this thing that's ugly, that is out there, and I, I, you know, I'm here to say, I apologize. And there was such power in that statement. And yet you always have this other thing, because everybody will go and say, I had an Angolan speak, and he said this, and that's all we remember is the bad thing. And Yvonne, you said initially that your relationship with Nairobi and Kenya is interesting, psychotic. psychotic. <laughs> And one of the things I was telling Yvonne I noticed about her books is when you read Dust, you read Dragonfly Sea, you read Weight of Whispers, Nairobi is there but not really. It's like she's like, that place. And her characters have a very ambivalent relationship with Nairobi that I feel is also you being ambivalent. So it was interesting to hear what you said. So do you want to talk about Dust, Dragonfly, Yvonne, and Nairobi or Kenya? <laughs> Well, about Nairobi, the, the next book I'm struggling with, it, The Long Decay, is actually a Nairobi story. So I'm going to reread this, Jackie, because you've given... Uh, I've been struggling with it because I don't want to write bad things, strangely enough, um, about this city. <laughs> because I know the work goes out there, yet I want to write an honest uh, piece. I want to... Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, it'll be interesting. I think you've... I've, I felt a moment of liberation when you said what you said. Um, but let me, well, let's talk about maybe Dragonfly Sea, since um, uh, yeah, just to address this particular idea of, um, of, of home seems to be older than time, and yet it's forgotten, uh, it, yet it seems to also be forgotten by time, by contemporary time. 
And when, she, when it starts off, she's waiting for, uh, well, for those who know the story already, she's waiting for a person, a father, who might or might not exist. So the idea of restlessness at home, because there's a sense of, in, a sense of um, incompletion, um, and the imagination that, the, that, that com you will find, she will find wholeness when this uh, mythical, mystical father shows up. Um, and, and the faith of the little child that is, you know, believes that such a person will show up. Um, and, but even, and when that doesn't happen, she makes her own decisions about who her father's going to be. But that does not complete her sense of belonging on, on this little island that is, like I say, older than time. Um, and so she ends up leaving, but in her, in her departure, going into this place because of blood ancestry, because of others who had landed on the island and had bestowed upon her this, uh, the bloodline, or if you want the call, the call of a different kind of home, where even if she goes there, um, is, when she goes there, all she discovers is that she's not of this place. Yet she is. She looks as if she, she should be of this place. But yet coming back home, coming back to this island that she had abandoned. Um, but the, what, has, what has remained consistent uh, in, in the reflection of, of, this, of this kind of tale, and, and probably it, it points to my own sense of uh, um, both ambivalence to permanence, um, is what remains, what remains constant for her is the sea. Um, and it is wherever she immerses herself um, in the sea, and the, particularly the Swahili seas, um, um, without stating it, that is when she is most, um, uh, how do you say it, she has a sense of complete, I think belonging, but, but maybe belonging is too drastic a word. It's only in this conversation that I was aware of the, um, of the, the, the epigram in this book. It's from the poet Carlos Trumont de Andrade. In the sea, there was a city written out. The idea that uh, the, the, the sea is not merely about water. Uh, there's incredible, um, more than stories within the water. There's a, I love the idea of that. There was a, there's, a city there's a city written out in the waters and to this particular character, I think I've just learned ah, that's where her home is as well. So that's. <laughs> and if you're looking for the line of Portuguese in the book, she's helped you find it. It's in the epigram. I want to link what you're saying. And we've talked a lot about home, and you've actually been talking about identity and this sense of belonging. And one thing that for me, moving away from these particular books, but also looking at the books and what we've been talking about, is. It seems to me a lot of the writers at this festival and a lot of the, your work, all of you, is about challenging you know, that official history. I think it's the history of the capital H. And we're getting a whole range. I think on the opening night, Novuyo said, there is a particular history of, of Zimbabwe that people know that's centered in Harare, that belongs to a certain group of people, that um, gives us names to look up to. And she said, well, my book is about looking at others. And I was saying to her earlier, one of the things I love best about her book is that the first half is one person's version of one story, of the same history, and then you get to hear another person's version, but it's not repeating it, it's moving, it's giving us more understanding, more nuance. It's you know, saying, well, this person was living this history in a male body from a particular perspective, this one is in a female body from a particular, so it's really rich in that way. And my question to you is, does shared histories create a sense of identity and belonging? Um, and Johnny, you brought that also to mind when you said, okay, we're both here and we're both from Finland. And we didn't know all this, but suddenly we're both from Finland and so we connect. It's the going out and being in an airport and hearing someone speak Swahili in a corner and they suddenly become your best friend. Yet in Nairobi, you wouldn't look at them twice, right? So do shared histories create a sense of identity, shared identity and belonging, or dot, dot, dot? Yvonne, your turn to start. Okay. I, 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 a, I, was in, I was in Cape Town a, a couple of years ago at the V&A waterfront. Uh, I was just standing, kind of looking around, and probably looking a, a bit 
out of place. When this person of Asian origin comes over to me and says, are you Kenyan? I said, yes, I am. And then he hugged me. He says, these people are strange. <laughs> And so we, we ended up having coffee and a major gossip session. <laughs> but uh, it would never happen in Nairobi. I wouldn't approach a stranger at all. Um, and there'd be, there'd be finer lines um, to cross. But in that place, there was a, we suddenly, actually at that moment, if we could have stood, at, stood on a high stone to sing the national anthem of Kenya, we would have. <laughs> so they, these are, these are kind of, uh, these are, there are ways in which there are connections, but I think, like I said, coming, flying back here, we never, we never called each other again when we landed in Nairobi, maybe in different ways. Um, but I don't know if there's something that happens with the geography, with the space, um, uh, that then uh, um, transmutes things. So whereas before, maybe out there, we would have found a reason to, to, to bond uh, maybe because of our, our shared um, alienation in that space, um, coming back home, then the other issues, the things I call the demons and the ghosts and the things in the skeletons that still lurk and rattle, um, limit then the, the, the connection and, yeah. Hmm. These demons that you're carrying around. So you're saying we have one home when we're out there. When you reach Kenya, we also have other homes. We all now start. And those homes may not be physical. It may be our senses of community. Okay, thank you. You want him? Or? Okay. Gonna. I think there is a, a way of telling stories. I, I mean, I would recognize... Uh, not, a, not exactly, all, not only a guy from Angola, but a guy from Luanda, a guy or a girl, the way he or she uh, tells a story. There is a very specific way of believing in the story you're telling, in one way. It's some sort of um, um, pacto, um, I don't know the word, pacto, like something that you sign, pacto between... A pact, a pact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry? Yeah, um, you, you, which is the one who's telling you the story knows he's doing something magical. The one who's receiving the story knows he's doing so. Example, even in Luanda or outside Luanda, if you come, you arrive, and you know five minutes late or whatever, just don't say I'm sorry I'm late. This is a lack of respect for me. So I was waiting for you. I need a good story. <laughs> no, your mother died. Your grandmother was flying from I don't know where, and now you know I will understand why you were late. So just don't come with an excuse like very poor excuse. It's an excuse. It has to be a good story, amuses us, you know, and we will live that moment. In the, I'm late. I'm sorry. I'm late. I'm, I'm sorry. You're sorry. I'm late. I'm late. What's that? I'm sorry. I'm late. It's, you know. Um, so it's, and then so there is the pleasure of telling a story. There is, for me at least, the pleasure of receiving uh, um, a story, you know? And for me, really, it's more the how, the how you tell the story, of course, and what we do with that moment, you know? Even kids know that, you know? My, my, my nephew, my nieces, they're, now they're eight, but you know, when they're younger, they would tell me, you know, can you tell me a story? And I would tell a story. And they would say, no, a real story. Not the books, the dragons, or whatever. A real story. Then you would tell a real story. You know, yesterday we were doing this. And the guy would look at me, no, a good story. <laughs> so it's demanding all the time. You know, you need to perform. And people in Luanda, and listen, we are 8 million in Luanda right now. They, you know, it's very embarrassing for us, the writers, because anyone can tell a story in Luanda better than we do. Anyone. If you are a writer in Luanda, you have to be careful. Because everyone has a better story than, than you do. You know, people say, ah, I'm a writer. You're a writer, I have a better story, you know. <laughs> you write the story, so I read your book, but I'm going to tell you, I have something better to tell you. And then, you know, it goes on, so which, which is good. So I think it's, in a way, that and the accent, it's very beautiful. That's how you recognize, you know. In, it's not exactly in Angola. We are so mixed in terms of ethnicities and all. I find somebody at the airport and he speaks Portuguese. I know immediately if he's from Mozambique, Cape Verde, Guinea. Portugal, Brazil, East Timor, I know, I know. Maybe I would make a mess between Mozambique and Angola. But in the second sentence, 
No, this guy is from Mozambique, you know? So this is beautiful also how either stories or language can help you to identify. And yes, it happens, I think it happens. When you're outside of Angola, everyone loves Angola, everyone greets the Angolans, you know, when you're inside, like, <laughs> like you know, you don't care. So we, by the time we finish, the last thing that you must do on Jackie is give us a really good story for why you were two minutes late. <laughs> Johnny, go on. <laughs> you set yourself up. <laughs> Johnny, go on, go on, let him think. So, <laughs> I don't need to think. <laughs> so, I mean, your, your question is whether shared histories necessarily lead to identification. I'd say the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, mostly, when there is violence, when there is animosity, it is between people who share histories. Um, so very often, I mean, almost as a rule, you know, any Holocaust you can think of in the modern world is between people who know each other very well. And the subject we've been talking about is the violence in South Africa. I mean, the violence in South Africa a couple of weeks ago was p committed by poor people, very, very angry at a system, but they attacked people who were the most approximate to them. Uh, attack people who are also marginal, people who actually shared a great deal with them. So I think that, I think that shared history is no inoculation against hatred, against anger, and, and it takes something else. And to give another example, it's just to extend something that Anjaki said. Now Anjaki said, do you tell the truth to outsiders? Do you particularly tell the truth in the north? <laughs> uh, what, what are they going to do with that truth? Do you, can you trust them with it? So. There's been a lot of trouble in the North lately, and, and the responses in the Global South have been so interesting. You know, huge economic crisis in Portugal and other Southern Europe, this maniac coming to power in America, um, constitutional crisis in Britain. Across the Global South, I hear so often almost a sense, almost a sense of relief. Ah, so, so there's trouble there too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So maybe now it's safer to share some of our trouble with them because they're also in trouble. Um, so there's some shared history leading to, in a sense, it's saying, let's not tell the truth about our home to them because they'll throw stones at our home. But now if their home, we can throw stones at their home too because it's also not so perfect. So that's another, maybe slightly attenuated way, but it's another way in which shared history can create a bit of um, uh, friction between people. Mm. And one of the things that strikes me is often a lot of, as you said, animosities, even wars, start because we've got a contention over what we call home. And we say it's our home, and you say it's your home, and then we, we start fighting. I have so many questions, and you guys have raised things. On Jackie, I have a minute before I want to go to everybody. Okay. So what was the excuse? What is the story? What's the story? So, no, it has I, to be just, very good, and Angola's <laughs> reputation <laughs> is at stake. Is at stake. I thought we would do it in the end. No, we're not doing it okay. in the end. We'll do it now? Okay, it's you a very it short now. one. It's, um, there is a sentence in this book, in Portuguese makes more sense, but I'll tell it in English. I don't know how he translated that, because in Portuguese it's a very specific way of saying that. It's, it's not even an expression. Vermelho devagarinho. So I would put it, I would put it slowly red. The translator chose lazy red. It's okay, but it's devagarinho, it's a very specific way of saying that something is exactly, extremely slowly, you know, devagarinho, it's not even devagar, it's like more. So this expression, I wa was once at Manuel Ruiz's house, the Angolan writer, and he told me this story that I'm going to tell you. So that's where this came from, this lazy red. <laughs> then when the book came out and there is a note in there, thank you Manuel Ruiz for this story, lazy red said, I've never ever told you that story. <laughs> But it's okay for me because, you know, I was there and he told me that story. The story is that there was this lady interviewing a little girl in Angola. I don't know, I think it was during the war. And she started making questions and hard questions. And then I think she asked her what her favorite color was. And she was trying to figure out the color, the girl. And she says, well, it's not exactly yellow. And, and the girl interviewing was interrupting her all the time. Oh, so it's not yellow, it's, it's orange. I said, no, no, not exactly orange. You know, it's between, uh, oh, so it's, it's, it's uh, uh, orange, red, it's green, it's, it's pink. Is it pink? And the girl said, no, wait, wait, wait. And she was trying to figure that out and said, no, é um vermelho devagarinho. It's a lazy red. You know, that, that thing, that ex lazy red, vermelho devagarinho, I could have not invented that or, or no one. She did, that girl. 
And Manuel Hui told me, now Manuel Hui doesn't remember. I don't know, maybe Manuel Hui did it. I don't know, somebody created that. That's the story, the story of how he created the lazy red. Okay, and we, we forgive him, do we? Yes, does he pass? Yes. I thought he started with a slug. How is he taking us to slowness at the end? It's now, I have 15 minutes. I don't see my prefect at the back. And this is how we're gonna do the questions. I will let you guys talk for 15 minutes. If one person chooses to talk for 15 minutes, that's the only person we'll listen to, right? So in other words, we're now coming down here. And if, again, have you heard me? If I give it to Margareta and she talks for 15 minutes, that means nobody else will talk. But since we're such amazing, wonderful people, and we want to show our guests that Kenyans are very good in accommodating, in allowing other people to have a voice, in showing the world how democracy works, we are going to be very good about saying what we have to say and allowing other people to speak. Is that an agreement? Yes. So I see Margareta's hand. And then from there, I'll just look around and I'll come to you. The reason I stay with my mic is that if you go very long and I feel like I'm about to be lynched, I will take it away from you. First, I want to thank all these uh, panelists and writers, and you, Mshai, marvelous, you're number four. Uh, so I will not go beyond, but I have to read your books. I read uh, Dragonfly Seed, and I love it. It's marvelous. But I wanted to ask Johnny, because I'm wondering, as a South African writer, forgive me, but I want to ask, what gave you the artistic license to write, an, uh, I haven't read the book, uh, um, artic, artistic license to write about a Somali refugee. Okay. My question. Okay, so Johnny has a question. Anybody else? Are you just awed and you're just thinking? Thank you. Please tell us your name so that as I take notes, then I'll be able to know to make sure they answer you. My name is Gerald Kivinji. I'm from Kenya, a place called Meru. Uh, but um, when I was at college, at the university here, I wrote a poem. And I said, at the beginning I said, I'm a citizen of the world. So now I've traveled a bit and I've written more, but I'm just wondering whether that is true or whether or not it's not. So I'll tell you a story about my uncle. My uncle, no, it will be so fast, so fast. My uncle went to, my own, my uncle, my own uncle, Julius, went to Rome. And he looked around for another black face and he never saw any. He walked the streets and walked until he saw somebody. He saw somebody far who was black, he was Guinean. And that person also saw him. They started running towards each other. They ran until they grasped one another and they realized they didn't know their languages. They couldn't, nobody, <laughs> the, the Guinean speaks French and he speaks English, so they couldn't communicate. But they held each other like this and walked throughout the street and enjoyed themselves. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs>